Brian Johnson is the world's most qualified person. He spends nearly $2 million a year trying to reverse his biological age. I've made a few videos about his routine in terms of diet and exercise, but Brian Johnson also takes many different kinds of supplements. In fact, he takes up to 105 different pills per day. So in this video, we're going to take a look at his supplementation routine, and I'm just going to give my own thoughts and opinions about what he's taking. Do it! So, Brian Johnson's blueprint, or the protocol that he's uh, following, is actually publicly available. It's at blueprint.brianjohnson.co. So, here's the supplements. Like I said, he takes about 105 different pills per day, which is uh, quite a lot. Upon waking, after waking up, he takes a carbose. 200 milligrams, which is a prescription, let's say, diabetic uh, drug. And uh, mostly it's uh, done to regulate blood sugar levels and reduce hemoglobin A1c. And the mechanism by which a carbose uh, works is through slowing down carbohydrate uh, digestion. From a longevity side, of course, reducing the blood sugar levels and hemoglobin A1c is quite important. But there are like some mouse studies as well uh, showing how um, the a carbose can actually result in increasing median at least in males, median life uh, lifespan by 22%, and in females by only a 5%. So there's a much significant lifespan extension effect in male mice compared to female mice. A lot of these different longevity supplements and you know interventions actually have a like, much more significant effect in males than in females. And so this is not the only one actually. But the acarbose also has potential negative side effects, and one of the main ones is actually that it can decrease muscle mass and muscle function in patients with type two diabetes. Now, of course, people with type 2 diabetes already are at a risk of higher sarcopenia and muscle loss and frailty, but uh, apparently based on this uh, retrospective cross-sectional study, they found that a carbos treatment was associated with decreased muscle mass and strength. This is something that everyone has to think if it is worthwhile for them to take a carbose. I personally am not taking a carbose. Decrease in muscle mass and strength, hand grip strength, etc. And gait speed, actually, all those things are one of the biggest predictors of longevity and reduced mortality in humans. If you're a diabetic, then of course, it's better to manage your blood sugar and manage diabetes with prescription dr drugs. But if you're like someone who is Brian Johnson, who doesn't have diabetes, I personally don't see a practical benefit of taking something like metformin or acarbose and of course there's also some other less dangerous side effects so acarbos as well as metformin they can have like some gastrointestinal side effects at least in this study they found that acarbos led to mild or moderate intestinal symptoms in 50 percent of the patients within the first four weeks but in only 13.8 percent of the patients within the last four weeks so initially there appears to be like some sort of adaptation period that initially you get some gastrointestinal symptoms next supplement on the list is gonna be ashwagandha 600 milligrams it does have a lot of these adaptogenic effects so it helps to you know improve stress resilience reduce cortisol levels and there is actually a pretty solid evidence that evidence that it does help to raise testosterone levels as well there is however some like a segment of people online that i've noticed who share their anecdotal experience that they experience this under antenonia or this somewhat of a serotonergic effect that it makes them a bit more dull and makes them a bit more let's say less in touch with their emotions now personally i am i'm not taking ashwagandha b complex vitamin b complex so uh, if you don't know then uh, brian johnson's eating uh, like oh yeah like a 99% vegan diet. Uh, the only animal protein that he consumes is uh, collagen peptides. So he takes 10 to 15 grams of collagen peptides in his morning uh, shake. So the B complex makes sense. Brocomax, so this is a sulforaphane booster. I do think that sulforaphane supplements are pretty powerful as a way to boost glutathione. Now he is eating a lot of cruciferous vegetables already. I'm not sure if it is like or how much of an effect would adding a sulforaphane supplement twice a day even for him have because uh, yeah he's e eating already <laughs> a lot of uh, cruciferous vegetables and uh, all his meals are pretty much packed with all these antioxidants from these plant foods so yeah i would like to know like if he knows like how much of a difference does this actually play for someone like the average person who is eating like the standard american diet then a sulforaphane booster probably have a lot much bigger effect vitamin c 500 milligrams or same question he's eating you know plant-based he's getting a ton of vitamin c so i don't know uh, what's the effect size that he's expecting to get from this vitamin C because antioxidant supplementation alone hasn't been found to have any lifespan extending effects even in animal models that much uh, and in some uh, animal models inhibiting the antioxidant defense uh, mechanism actually extends their lifespan so it's not that you need to 
reduce the oxidative stress and inflammation all the time. And uh, in some studies, they find actually that antioxidant supplementation like vitamin C, vitamin E and vitamin A is actually associated with increased mortality risk. So I personally believe that not all oxidative stress and not all inflammation is bad. You do need actually some of the inflammation oxidative stress to turn on your body's own antioxidant defense systems like glutathione. But vitamin C in smaller doses, good for collagen synthesis. So vitamin C is actually the nutrient needed to initiate collagen synthesis. So a person who is under like chronic inflammation and chronic oxidative stress, for them, 500 milligrams of vitamin C might make sense. But for someone like Brian Johnson, I would suspect that he would be getting away with even like 50 milligrams, which is enough for the collagen synthesis. Uh, so next up is calcium alpha-glutoglutarate. It's actually one of the like a new superstar in the longevity supplement sphere because this 2021 uh, study found that um, rejuvent, which is uh, the calcium alpha-glutoglutarate, uh, it did result in eight years reduction in biological age in humans after an average of seven months of use. And this is actually quite profound results. Of course, this is the only human study we have right now. In other animals, the calcium AKG does extend their lifespan as well. And this human study at least supports that it does reduce the biological age based on this test. But the issue with these tests is that it doesn't really tell you your biological age. It only tells you one specific aspect of your biological age, which is the DNA methylation. So DNA methylation measures your epigenetic changes, <laughs> but there's also, also like, you know, nine other hallmarks of aging that matter, like senescence, telomere length, uh, mitochondrial function, etc. So it's it's not that this, this one particular biomarker, the DNA methylation, immediately tells you your entire age. So that's a bit misleading. And I talked with Matt Caberlin as well on my podcast, and he agrees with that, that these uh, epigenetic biological clock tests, they only measure like one specific aspect of uh, longevity and aging. So it's a viable biomarker for sure. It can be used similar, you would use like blood work or telomere length, etc. But it doesn't tell you your overall biological age. When I did do the DNA methylation test that measured your epigenetic age, then it did show that I was nine years younger. When I did the test, I was 25 and my results were 16. Cocoa flavanols, 500 milligrams, cocoa, dark chocolate, raw cacao powder is actually very good uh, for the polyphenols. In 2022, the Cosmos trial, they uh, used a cocoa supplement, which uh, showed that uh, cocoa extract supplementation, it didn't significantly reduce total cardiovascular events among older adults, but it reduced cardiovascular disease death by 27%. So, uh, of course, death <laughs> is, is, is the final outcome that you want to avoid. You know, although it didn't reduce the events of cardiovascular disease, uh, but they did reduce the amount of deaths by 27%, which I think is still obviously a good win. But I I, I, I do take dark chocolate and um, cacao flavanols as well every day. D3, vitamin D3, 2000 I use. I think that's a good baseline dose to take. And uh, vitamin D3 supplementation is associated with reduced mortality. Uh, you don't get all the benefits of sunlight from the D3 supplement. So you do still want to get exposure to actual sunlight. <laughs> of course, you don't want to get sunburn, you don't want to get skin damage from excess sunlight exposure, but uh, being in a cave and never getting exposed to sunlight is also bad because the UV radiation has these very unique benefits that you don't get from a supplement. DHEA, so this is a testosterone precursor, 25 milligrams, and it's a relatively small dose. I see no harm in that. It probably is used to help with the testosterone levels, which we'll talk about later because he's taking the testosterone patch as well two milligrams as a TRT. I remember him saying something along the lines that uh, the reason he started taking the TRT patch was that when he first started this protocol, his testosterone levels dropped very low. So he needed to fix that <laughs> because yeah, like he's on a very low calorie diet. He's like 20 to 25% calorie restriction over the course of years and months uh, will inevitably lead to a reduction in testosterone levels. Technically, you shouldn't need TRT at the age of 45, um, although this would be the earliest age that uh, I would say is kind of okay to start taking it. Uh, of course, if you have like hypogonadal, if you're hypogonadal, uh, then uh, yeah, TRT is better than being the low TRT or being low testosterone. Next supplement is, uh, I guess it's vitamin E, 67 milligrams, a very low dose. I'm not gonna comment anything about that. It's just an antioxidant. And uh, in such small doses, it doesn't have, I would imagine not any significant effect. Uh, EPA, 500 milligrams. So this is the omega-3 fatty acid with vitamin E, 5 milligrams. So yeah, like uh, as a vegan diet, on a vegan diet, you would be better off by supplementing some EPA. Uh, but uh, I haven't seen any like choline in his supplement stack, which is also another, uh, this critical, uh, let's say, is a vitamin-like substance. 
that is also very deficient on a vegan diet and you get it mostly from like egg yolks and uh, liver but uh, the choline is actually one of the most important variables or factors that determines if you get fatty liver or alzheimer's over the course of your li entire lifetime so uh, i personally am taking even like alpha gpc for the choline and uh, especially if he's on a vegan diet i would say that I, mean, I would I would take like a choline supplement or alpha GPC on a vegan nut for sure. Garlic 2.4 grams and garlic 1.2 grams kaiolic garlic. So garlic is good for the cholesterol and lipids. It's very powerful for uh, lowering the uh, cholesterol levels, ApoB, as well as even it has a like, blood sugar management effects, and it can uh, actually boost some antioxidant defense as well. Ginger root 2.2 grams and it's an anti-inflammatory. Glucosamine sulfate, 1.5 grams. So uh, yeah, glucosamine is an anti-inflammatory. It helps with joints and uh, cartilage, but also has cardiovascular disease protective effects. And there is uh, actually some studies showing the use of glucosamine and chondroitin is associated with lower all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. So the uh, use was associated with a 39% reduction in all-cause uh, mortality and 65% reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality. Of course, this is an epidemiology study, but I, I do think that uh, glucosamine has good and it's very safe. It has very beneficial anti-inflammatory benefits and it also is an autophagy regulator. So I personally am taking glucosamine every day. I take three grams every day because a higher dose is needed to get the benefits for the joints at least. So he's taking 1.5 grams twice a day, so spread out, but I take 3 grams. Iodine as potassium iodide, 125 micrograms, so that's for the thyroid, probably. Uh, lithium as lithium orotate, 1 milligram. And uh, this is interesting uh, because there is some association with lithium uh, and reduced all-cause mortality, as well as suicide mortality, <laughs> because uh, especially because most of those, uh, you know, suicide and... Uh, self-harm associated mortalities uh, in people who have like some sort of mental mental disorders or bipolar uh, patients or uh, schizophrenia and those kind of things so lithium has beneficial effects on the brain and it helps if you're like a let's say a person who doesn't have any mental disorder then it's going to improve your brain health and it's going to improve your brain longevity and uh, but it does help to stabilize like yeah mental disorders as well which is part of the reason why it's associated with reduced uh, suicide and homicide uh, rates. <laughs> so yeah, that's just interesting to uh, mention. Lycopene, so this is uh, one of the substances, or yeah, you get it from actually a lot of these carotenoid uh, vegetables, which uh, he's also eating a lot, so I don't personally, yeah, I don't take uh, lycopene, I guess. Uh, lysine is an amino acid that uh, is also anti-inflammatory, anti but it has has been found to have beneficial effects on like uh, muscle mass and muscle strength as well. Metformin, so this is another uh, prescription drug. And uh, yeah, there is association with metformin and reduced mortality in diabetics. And some of those diabetics even have reduced mortality compared to non-diabetics who aren't taking metformin, which of course makes, it, makes you think that, hey, even if you're diabetic and you take metformin, then you can live longer than non-diabetics who aren't taking metformin. But uh, that study, that particular study, uh, they didn't find they didn't replicate the same results so um, yeah metformin has maybe potential longevity benefits by managing your blood sugar but if you don't have diabetes then um, i personally don't think it's somewhat uh, you know that necessary to take especially if you're already eating like a very low carb and <laughs> all the other blood sugar management uh, supplements and some of the side effects may have to do yeah like again reduced eo2 max and uh, potentially reduced uh, muscle mass as well and uh, like nicotinamide riboside 375 milligrams so there's the nad booster so in this study they used this 17a estradiol which is this non-feminizing estrogen as well as uh, nicotinamide riboside and three other uh, drugs and they found that nicotinamide riboside doesn't affect uh, lifespan but the non-feminizing uh, estrogen which uh, brian johnson is also taking so this 17a ae2 that uh, did have a lifespan extending effect uh, in uh, mice, but uh, the nicotinamide riboside didn't. But I think that uh, the reason why Brian Johnson is taking the NR has to do with the NAD levels, not the potential lifespan extension benefits. So maintaining NAD levels is, is beneficial for longevity, but it doesn't have longevity or it doesn't have lifespan extending effects. It has health span ex extended effects by increasing your exercise capacity and 
like your insulin sensitivity, but it doesn't have direct lifespan extending effects. And acetylcysteine, NAC, so that's the supplement that is also on my top three list that I think is everyone pretty much should take 1800 uh, milligrams twice a day. So he's taking 3.6 grams of NAC a day, <laughs> which is quite a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I don't think that is anything harmful there for that. There's no like real adverse effects to NAC with the possible exception of histamine intolerance. So NAC can reduce histamine breakdown. So if you are someone who has autoimmune disorders or histamine sensitivity, then uh, I wouldn't recommend taking large amounts of NAC all the time because it can, yeah, just make you break out uh, in terms of histamine reactions. And NAC also does reduce inflammation, which uh, may, again, suppress some of the muscle growth uh, pathways. So Brian Johnson, I don't think he's trying to build muscle. He's trying to maintain the muscle. Um, so his BMI is 22, which is quite low, uh, but it's still in the lowest mortality range. So the lowest mortality for his age in a BMI is 22 to 25. And uh, he's in the kind of sweet spot for that. So he's not definitely not trying to build muscle. He's trying to maintain it and reduce the inflammation. And uh, like still exercise, like exercise is still beneficial. And even if you don't build muscle, then exercise and resistance training is still uh, positive for the longevity, even if you don't build muscle. But uh, regardless, NAC is yeah, something that I take. I don't take it every day, but uh, I take it every other day, if that makes sense. One interesting thing is that he's not taking uh, glycine because the glynac combo, so glycine NAC, is a very research. There's like, I think like five human studies showing that it affects the hallmarks of aging and yeah, improves glutathione, reduces oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, hallmarks of aging, metabolic defects, uh, cognitive decline and everything. So it actually has proven benefits for reducing the hallmarks of aging in humans and in mice. The Glynac combo has been found to extend lifespan by 24%. So it's interesting why he's not taking the glycine. So he is getting 3 grams of glycine from his 10 grams of collagen peptides, but it's I don't think it's nearly enough for the optimal amount of um, glycine. So for the optimal amount of glycine, you need at least 15 grams of glycine. Because first of all, your body makes 3 grams of glycine. 3 grams of glycine is used to produce glutathione, creatine, and heme but 12 grams is needed for optimal collagen turnover. So he's getting maybe like a very small amount of glycine from his diet because he's not eating any jello. He's not eating any these tendons and ligaments. There are some plant foods that have glycine, but not in that high amounts. So uh, if you want to really, you know, optimize your collagen synthesis and collagen turnover for the skin benefits, then you need at least 15 grams of glycine as a supplement. So he's getting three grams from the collagen peptides and he might get two or three grams from his diet. But that still leaves like at least a 10 gram deficit, in my opinion. And I have, you know, multiple videos about the glycine and uh, how much you need, etc. You can check it out. But uh, yeah, I personally am taking glycine. I think it's, it's in, even in found to extend lifespan as well by up to 20 to 40 percent by mimicking a methionine restriction. So I don't see a reason why he wouldn't uh, want to take glycine. Uh, so at least based on my research, there's no like reason not to uh, take uh, glycine, at least in my opinion. Next supplement is proferrin. So this is an iron supplement. So he's on a vegan diet and uh, yeah, makes sense for him to get it. And, and he's not at risk of uh, atherosclerosis or uh, liver damage or uh, other negative side effects of iron supplementation. So if you're already eating a lot of iron and you take an iron supplement as well, then that is associated with increased cardiovascular disease uh, because of excess iron. Um, but uh, because he's not eating really that much iron or pretty much no iron from his diet almost at all, like the actual heme iron, then yeah, like makes sense for him to boost that with a supplement. Turmeric with piperine, one gram. So that's another anti-inflammatory, helps with sulforaphane as well. Uh, taurine, one gram, amino acid that helps a lot with exercise capacity and blood pressure and cardiovascular function. I, I am a fan of taurine as well. I'm taking it uh, myself. Ubiquinol, so CoQ10, 100 milligrams for the mitochondria. So why not? I think that's a very staple for a lot of longevity snacks. Zeaxanthin, 20 milligrams of lutein and 4 milligrams of as uh, zeaxanthin. So this is another of these. Um, you get it a lot from the carotenoids. So it's good for eye health, which is very important for aging as well. But uh, for him, I think he's eating a lot of this lutein and stuff like that from his diet already because of these different colorful vegetables. So yeah, uh, maybe it's a bit redundant, but I think 
at the same time it doesn't hurt <laughs> either uh, zinc 15 milligrams so uh yeah there's not a lot of plant-based sources of zinc and the most bioavailable ones are in uh, animal proteins so adding 15 milligrams of zinc makes sense dinner another a carbose dose uh, brocomax vitamin c calcium cocoflavanols epa garlic ginger glucosamine hyaluronic acid so this is a uh, Another supplement that has become popular for its potential benefits for skin health and skin aging. I agree. I am taking hyaluronic acid as well. It's a good one. I, a, I have no comments on uh, on that one. So next up, uh, tyrosine, 500 milligrams. So tyrosine is actually the main precursor to dopamine, which, uh, yeah, uh, I am at a baseline. I'm at like a high dopamine already. Like it's very easy for me to get focused and get uh, motivated. So I have no issues with that and i actually have tried supplementing tyrosine it didn't work for me like uh, it just made me a bit too high dopamine if that makes sense uh, maybe brian johnson is someone different maybe his baseline is lower dopamine who knows uh, but yeah that's the main reason i would imagine why taking the tyrosine and it's interesting to take it in evening uh, i would imagine taking it in morning would might have more positive effects for productivity and like mood and stuff like that Metformin, again, uh, NSE, nicotine riboside, and turmeric. So that's the dinner supplements. Before bed, 300 micrograms of melatonin. So that's good. I think every for an everyday basis, if you're taking melatonin every day for the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory benefits, which is good for longevity, melatonin is, I think, uh, as a hormone, is the most one of the most important ho hormones for longevity. Uh, so like if you take it every day before bed, then a smaller dose like 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 milligrams or 300 micrograms is the way to go because if you take too much then you might get actually groggy and you might might like just feel <laughs> much more tired after waking up like if i take one to three milligrams of melatonin then the next day i wake up a bit more tired actually so a smaller dose is uh, more beneficial if you're taking it on an everyday basis and i do think that uh, a small dose of melatonin such as 300 micrograms every day every day is safe and it's actually good and these are the other supplements or these additional compounds extra virgin olive oil 30 milliliters a day i am a fan of olive oil i think it's one of the healthiest oils in the world high polyphenol content and it is one of the most associated longevity foods in the world like um, all the mediterranean countries uh, they are high in uh, extra virgin olive oil and uh, yeah the use of olive oil is associated with all these health benefits as well probably due to the high polyphenol uh, content. Pea protein, 29 grams a day to get more protein into his diet. Dark chocolate, 15 grams. So that's a uh, yeah, good, good one to add as well for the polyphenols and boost dopamine and actually it tastes good. Rapamycin, 13 milligrams bi-weekly prescription drug. So uh, yeah, rapamycin, it suppresses mTOR and uh, in a lot of animal studies, it extends lifespan and uh, there is no... You know, I mean, in humans studies, it does have some positive effects as well in slowing down some of the process of aging. I think it's very early to say if it actually extends lifespan in humans. But out of all the longevity supplements and drugs out there, then rapamycin is definitely the most powerful one. It definitely has the you know, most researched effects in terms of extending lifespan. And I do think that it works. Probably it works. Uh, we just don't have enough data yet. Uh, or like long-term clinical safety studies. But I personally think based on the research we have right now, I think it works. Whether or not you should take it, you know, you need to assess, you know, what's your situation and what's your age. Someone who is in their, 40, in their 40s, like Brian Johnson, for his age, I think it's worthwhile to take someone for me in my 20s, probably not. <laughs> so because, yeah, I mean, rapamycin still uh, reduces, let's say, muscle protein synthesis and makes it harder to build muscle as well so uh yeah but he's taking it bi-weekly which makes it i guess uh, a bit better i wouldn't take it like every day so growth hormones he's taking growth hormone as well 0 0.6 milligrams five times a week um i think this is a new addition to his diet or this uh, protocol uh, i would like to know yeah like what's some of the changes that he's going to report but uh, at least based on you know some animal studies then growth hormone is also actually one of the pathways that is associated with aging so excess growth hormone ages you faster and um, yeah i wonder what's the effects that he's gonna see uh, and if he's gonna keep it later on but yeah growth hormone alone people use it as, a, as like this you know growth hormone as a drug and uh, they they do use it as part of part of the trt and hormone replacement therapy uh, protocols to help with the uh, you know aspects of just 
muscle maintenance and uh, like functionality. But uh, as a hormone, the pathway of growth hormone and IG-1 is associated with aging, at least in animals as well. But it does definitely help with the, let's say, health span. Like you just feel better <laughs> probably if you add uh, growth hormone. And this is the non-feminizing estrogen that we talked about that uh, does extend lifespan in male mice. But um, yeah, it's very new. Like I've only seen over the past few months people talking about it. So yeah, we'll see what's, what's going to happen. It's pretty much very experimental uh, as of now. But it's the non-feminizing uh, estrogen. So it doesn't have the feminizing effects. So the testosterone, the TRT patch, 2 milligrams, 6, six times a week. And uh, yeah, like I said... He needed to add it pretty much to uh, raise his testosterone after being on this uh, calorie-restricted diet. And I think many people need to realize that as well if they want to test and try out the Brian Johnson's blueprint as well. Because there are many people trying it. And uh, if they're not aware that they potentially may need to start TRT in the future, then, you know, they need to be aware of that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like many people just look at the protocol at a glance. Okay, eat this calorie deficit, eat these uh, foods, etc. But they might not go into the depths of, you know, that you need to might that you might need to take TRT. So that's why I think it should be one of the highlights that hey, this is a still a medical requirement, <laughs> and uh, you know the average person maybe wouldn't be uh, willing to go into that depths. And there's no evidence to suggest that you need to be, let's say, this particular protocol to slow down the aging or longevity, like. The centenarians, the people who live over 100, they're not taking 100 pills per day. <laughs> of course, they're exercising. Of course, they're lower body weight. And of course, they're eating less calories. Um, but there's no track record of centenarians doing the blueprint. So the blueprint is just Brian Johnson's own N equals 1 protocol that uh, he's doing. And he's, of course, sharing all his, like results. And we can see that, yes, it does work for him in a lot of ways that his biomarkers are improving. But, uh, you know, there's, of course, many things that might be redundant. There's many things that might be overkill. And there's many things that might have some negative side effects, at least for some people as well. So you definitely don't need to follow the blueprint to, to 100%. And, uh, and, and I mean, if you are exercising and eating a good diet and losing weight, then that's not the blueprint. That's just a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> it's just that if you follow this specific, uh, let's say, protocol, then you're following the blueprint. But uh, the other healthy lifestyle is something that people have been doing for decades and uh, centuries even almost, like the, just maintaining physical activity and uh, good relationships. And uh, yeah, you know, that, you know what I'm talking about. And the last supplement is B12 uh, once a week. So yeah, he's not eating any B12 from his diet uh, because of the plant-based foods. And there were some supplements that weren't on the list as well. So spermidine, so he's not taking an actual spermidine supplement. I think he's getting the spermidine from chlorella powder, which is a high source of spermidine. And he's going to get 13.5 milligrams of spermidine. And one recent uh, study did show that the uh, dietary consumption of spermidine at a dose of over 11 milligrams per day uh, was associated with up to 30% reduced mortality compared to getting less than 9.6 milligrams of spermidine per day from dietary sources. So I do th agree that uh, dietary spermidine source is probably much more important uh, than the supplemental spermidine. At least we have the data on the dietary spermidine. We don't have any data on supplemental spermidine extending lifespan or being associated with redu reduced mortality. So I think that, yeah, like adding chlorella powder, spirulina, uh, wheat germ, cheeses, mushrooms, and different vegetables, even like meat has a little spermidine. So that's what where you want to get uh, your spermidine from. Amino complex, so I would assume that's essential amino acids. Uh, makes sense. Creatine, 2.5 grams as well. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, as a vegan, you don't get creatine from the plant sources. Although the creatine supplements are made of plant-based sources. So it's a vegan supplement, <laughs> but you don't get the dietary creatine uh, that much from uh, plant-based uh, foods. And the other one's the same, except Ceylon cinnamon, which uh, the main effect for that is it's high in polyphenols again, but it also helps with the blood sugar regulation. So there we have it. This is a long video of the Brian Johnson's blueprint supplement routine. You can check out my full breakdown of his entire routine, including diet and exercise. But overall, I would say that, yes, he's taken a lot of supplements. Are those supplements the main reason why he's seeing those uh, benefits in his health? Definitely not. Like he also agrees that the biggest effect comes from, you know, eating a good diet and exercising and getting good sleep. So those supplements are just adding maybe like 5 or 10% to the, 
to his results, whereas the vast majority of the other results come from the, the entire lifestyle. But do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.